the time it has turned uh, to give us a talk. Okay. Um, so here's our agenda. Uh, we're going to do things in three parts. First of all, we'll have the traditional NANOG uh, update. Um, the second section will be about the election, and the third section will be about the transition. <coughs> um, so all of the new NANOG stuff will be at the end. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, reminder, this is a meeting for all of us. We want to dialogue rather than a lecture. So if you have any questions or comments or want to throw things at us or give us gifts, step up to a mic and make yourself heard. Um, we don't want to be up here just lecturing to you. So I'll start off with the steering committee report. Um, the people with the blue badges like this are on the steering committee, so if you see us and want to complain about anything, you know how to find us. Anybody want a blue badge? That, that's the next section, Patrick. Yeah, you have to wait. Um, highlights in Snanog 49. Um, one of the nice things is that, uh, about what's been going on is that the actual Nanog stuff of it, the day-to-day -day stuff, has been really easy. There hasn't been a lot going on. Things are just working. Um, so I think we can give a lot of thanks to our host and to, and to Merritt and the rest of the people in the community for, for that. Um, that lets us, has let us focus on some of the future stuff that needed doing. So since the last meeting, we've been preparing for this meeting. Um, we've given out the Postel Nanog Operator Scholarship. Um, and I don't know if the recipient is here, but uh, if not, uh, hopefully we can uh, acknowledge him tomorrow. Um, and we've been preparing for this meeting and uh, future meetings uh, through 2011. And of course, we've been working on the transition stuff. After this meeting is over, um, we're going to disappear into a room and select a new, some new program committee members. Um, some more on that later. And uh, we're going to be uh, selecting some new communications committee members. Um, so if you plan, are, are program committee nominations still open? I can't remember if they closed yet or, or not. PC members, or nominations are still open, I think. CC. And CC members, definitely. If you want to be on the communications committee, if you want to control the mailing list, and, and be our filter of Senate or voice of reason, please volunteer. Oh, we'd love to have you. And we're going to start planning on um, meetings for 2012 and, of course, the other transition stuff that needs doing. Um, there's a whole bunch of mailing lists. If you want to be on them, look at the website. Uh, now I'll hand it over to Dave, who will tell us a little bit about the program committee. So I don't have any slides because um, every time I try to make them, they're incredibly boring. They're like pie charts with we got 45 uh, submissions and we accepted 30 of them. It's really boring stuff. The more important thing is, um, um, like Steve said, um, we have yellow. The program committee have yellow, has yellow badges. So if there's things about the program that you like or don't like, please find one or more of us and let us know. We kind of, um, the way it comes together is kind of, um, based on the efforts of the program committee members, and and so those are the people you want to get to to influence what the agenda is about. But beyond that, I don't have much for you, other than to give you back some of your time. Questions, comments? Yep. Anybody? Questions, comments, and concerns, of course. Was my talk accepted? Okay. All right. Thanks, Dave. Um, list of program committee members. Um, they have color, they have yellow badges, so talk to them if you have program issues. Uh, next up is the communications committee. Mike Smith will report on them. We have the uh, red target badges, so if you can find us around. Um, we try to take a really light hand when it comes to moderating the list, and we're always looking for input on how people feel that we're doing. Um, sometimes we do get kind of direct comments, um, and they're always very helpful. Um, but Nanog Futures is a great place. If you think that more needs to be done or less needs to be done, um, we'd love to hear it. And I'd also like to um, echo and say that we really do need some extra people on the committee. Um, so if you have a little bit of time, um, please do uh, nominate yourself or someone close to you. Thanks. Nominate your friends instead of yourself. Mm -hmm. Or your enemies. Um, <laughs> anybody have any questions for, about the communications committee? All right. Next, Kat will tell us about what's been going on in the marketing working group. And there's a slide to the hip space. Oh, cool. So here's all of the marketing working group members. 
that I remember today. <laughs> um, we had full sponsorship attendance at the last NANOG in San Francisco, so that means that all of our breaks, our, yep, our, our vendor collaboration room, everything got filled up to, and was completely um, well attended with all our vendors. Um, and we also did a sponsorship appreciation lunch um, for pre-promotion of vendor spots at NANOG 50, which helped um, actually fill up the vendors for this NANOG much quicker than San Francisco, I'm told. So we, again, got full sponsorship attendance for here. Yay. <laughs> um, and there are plans, um, I don't know the details, but there are plans for another pre-promotion vendor lunch for this NANOG to discuss the next one. Uh, please make sure you check out the vendor collaboration room, which is in the Chastain room. Uh, we've got a bunch of great vendors there participating. Um, and I hear the rumors it might get called the NOG Lab in the future. I'm supposed to tell you guys that. So, might have a cool, catchy new name soon. That's all I have. Any questions? Questions? Uh, we haven't got to the fun part yet. Come on. Um, all right. Uh, next, Andy will tell us what's been going on at Merit. Well, I do have a few more slides, so I'll slow things down here just a little bit. Uh, first of all, let's thank our meeting host, Telex, who's done a great job. NANOG meeting hosts do a lot of tasks that help bring the meeting together. Uh, for example, providing network connectivity and engineering, electrical power here in the general session room. They coordinate a lot of the on-site meeting staffing and coordination and logistics. And they have, uh, again, gone above and beyond by sponsoring not one, but two off-site socials tonight uh, and tomorrow with some partners. Yes, one more time. Uh, named here are a number of contributors to the meetings, and you can read what their roles have been. Uh, Cox Communications, Myriad Supply, Internet 2, OSI Hardware, uh, Aaron, Spectrum Networks. Break sponsors in the morning and afternoons will be sponsored by PacNet, uh, Nokia, Hibernia Atlantic, Xscale Communications in Siena, and during their breaks, their representatives will be available out in the foyer. Beer and Gear will be Monday evening, and Beer and Gear sponsors also double as breakfast sponsors, so thank them doubly for that. Uh, they are Network Hardware Resale, Brocade, Keridan, Arbor Networks, Juniper Networks, Infinera, Alcatel Lucent, Cisco, OSI Hardware, and PCCW Global. As Kat mentioned, the vendor collaboration room opened at several points during the meeting. We hope you'll stop by. Uh, thanks to Alcatel Lucent, Eris, A10 Networks, and Comcast for putting that together for us. I'd like to acknowledge the Merit Network team who put in lots of effort over several months to bring the meeting together. Uh, here with us on the team for this meeting are Larry Blunk, David Gilbertson, Sue Joyner, Don Kahn, Rob Levitt, and Carol Wadsworth. Also joining us uh, as for the last couple meetings from Davenport University is Pete Hoswell and Fawn Callen from Western Michigan University. Let's give them a thanks. <laughs> to review what happened at uh, NANO 49 in San Francisco, great meeting, uh, attendance of 607, which is kind of a modern era record, depending on how you count things, sort of the, the post-bubble maximum we've had in attendance. Uh, of those, 505 paid and the rest waived for, for being speakers or sponsors and so forth. Uh, a third of the attendees were newcomers. That's been a bit of a norm for a few meetings here now. Nine students attended, 26 countries represented, and uh, 31 U.S. states plus D.C. I want to walk through the financial results briefly. There was revenue of 409,000, expenses of 423 for a balance of a negative 14,000. So a perfectly reasonable question at this point would be, uh, so how do you put on a meeting that has record attendance and a full sponsor uh, participation and still end up with a negative number? So let me provide a couple of the details uh, on that. First of all, uh, San Francisco is about as expensive a place you can put on a meeting uh, in the U.S. And, and the hosting 
dollars in relative terms were about 80,000, 70,000 more than a couple of previous meetings. Uh, on a per person basis, about 34% more cost per person in San Francisco than the last couple meetings. Now that I don't regard as the hugest factor because of course we knew that was going to be the case. San Francisco is just expensive and we build into the pricing and costs of Nanog uh, allowance for that factor so we can put on meetings in, in tier one cities as well as others. Uh, but it did, uh, it did do a lot to absorb the cushion that we build in. Uh, so also in the first portion of the year we had two fairly significant staff transitions uh, and the Merit staff who work on Nanog. Uh, the way we do budgeting and financing at Merit in terms of NANOG is that any identifiable costs that are attributed to NANOG are indeed put against the, uh, the revenues from a meeting. So as the timing of those two changes uh, went up against the San Francisco meeting, the costs of those were about $40,000. And so the, you can see that would have swung the, the balance if we were in steady state between the, the red we ended up with and a pretty, uh, pretty solid financial outcome. I'll mention two meetings upcoming, and there's definitely a third dimension, but I didn't have the date offhand, so we will, we will figure that out. Uh, Nanog 51 is in Miami in January and February, a great time to be in Miami, hosted by Terramark. Nanog 52 then, June 12th through 15, in Denver, hosted by Alcatel-Lucent. And Nanog 53 will be in Philadelphia in October 2011. Excellent. Okay, I did it. Any questions? All right. All right, that's the end of the first major topic. Now we're on to the election. Um, so first I'll go over the process, then uh, we'll hear from the steering committee candidates, and then we'll talk about the charter amendment and the new NOD bylaws. So the election process, uh, every year at the end of, at the last meeting of the year, we have an election. Um, everybody who's been to a meeting in the last two years, I think it is, is eligible to vote. Um, it's voting's done electronically. Um, there will be instructions if, they should already be on the NANOG uh, homepage. Um, when does, is voting open now? I can't recall. Okay. You can vote now. Um, you can vote anytime through, I think it's uh, early Wednesday morning. Um, once the voting closes, uh, the computers will chug away and, and uh, produce the results, and the results will be announced uh, around the end of the meeting on Wednesday. So stick around till uh, lunchtime Wednesday, and you'll get to hear who win, who won. Um, before I move on, are there any questions about the process itself? Or are we all clear? We've done it enough times. Um, please, if you do have an opinion on anything, vote. Um, the more people who vote, the, the better results we have, and and better uh, feeling that we have that we're representing the will of the community. Um, okay, we have five candidates for three open steering committee uh, positions. Um, as, as usual, every year, half of the steering committee is up for re-election. Um, before I go on, though, I want to thank Joe Provo, who's been on the steering committee for four years and is termed out this time, so he won't, he won't be coming back. But. <laughs> He's done a lot of great work for us over the years. He was the, the chair last year. Um, he volunteered to be the chair this year, and, and stupidly, I uh, also volunteered. But and, and interesting things happened this year. But anyway, um, let's go on to the, the candidates. Um, I want to assure everybody that uh, uh, at least the ones, the candidates that these are in random order. I did not uh, do them alphabetically, or because I dislike anybody more than other people. So I'm going to ask uh, first RS to come up and uh, give a brief. Um, Talk on why he would like to be a candidate. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. I have to wonder whether that was a response directly to the crack that I made earlier today about people with last names later in the alphabet always coming last. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm Rob Seastrom. Most of you folks know me, uh, or at least know me by name, if not face. Um, I been in the business for many years and been on the Nanog mailing list committee, uh, now called the communications committee, uh, served one term on the Nanog steering committee and would like to be elected to a second term. Um, my 
position statements up on the website, so I won't bore you by going through and reciting it again. Uh, basically, I just wanted to draw your attention to two things. One of them is that I believe there's unfinished work here. Uh, I'd like to be part of that unfinished work and making Nanog stand on its own as a uh, standalone organization. And I have previous experience with 501c3s, um, including a group that teaches firearm safety and a um, uh, amateur radio group, which has been around for quite a while and is much bigger than a lot of amateur radio groups. So. Uh, although that's not the same size or budget as NANOG, there's regulatory and other stuff that comes along with being a nonprofit, and uh, I bring that to the table, and I'd appreciate your support. Thank you. Hi, everybody. No, 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 no. Get your ass up here. <laughs> nice try. on the stream want to be able to see your face. Yeah, that's right. Who are you? Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Richard Steenbergen. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm clearly not giving enough Nanog presentations, so I'll have to do more. Um, I've been on the program committee for the last four years, so I'm termed out there. Uh, so basically, as I said on my uh, bio on the website, I've got nothing better to do but to run for the SC. Uh, and if you've got nothing better to do but to vote for me, then there you go. Um, Basically, I think Nanog's uh, been doing a really good job uh, on the reform process for the last few years. Uh, there's a, a lot more work to go with Nunog, and I want to help uh, move that forward, uh, make sure that, that everything goes smoothly, um, run on a platform of, of keeping the mailing list uh, on topic, uh, promoting all the policies that are necessary to do that, make it, make it uh, the place to be for all engineers to stay up on current stuff. Um, and if you vote for me, uh, my wife made these little M&Ms with a little dot matrix picture of like a rat's head. Uh, they came out surprisingly well. So if you vote for me, uh, see me or my wife after, and uh, you can get some M&Ms. John here. John Osman, are you here? Would you like to give a talk? All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, Mike, then. Hey, everybody. Um, Mike Smith, uh, chair of the Communications Committee, um, which means I've also been on the, the SC Committee as a non-voting member for the past year and have been working very hard in the back, um, uh, making sure that the new NOG um, effort is successful. Um, did some of the initial work on the pro forma, um, the RFP, and kind of just the general business modeling. Um, and I really want to continue doing that for the organization and uh, make this successful. So please do vote. Thanks. Hello, everyone. My name is Patrick, and I'm in out uh, wrong meeting. We, um, I'm not really sure what to say. Uh, my platform is pretty simple. I helped start uh, what became Nunog, and I feel that I need to see it through. The thing is, there are three slots, and there are five really well-qualified uh, participants. So the good news is that um, Nanog, Nunog, whoever it is, cannot lose, because any three of these guys, well, any three of the other four people would be really good to elect. Um, if you feel that uh, you know, we're going in the right direction and that I'm helping out, um, and meaning you're not, obviously not Randy Bush because he obviously doesn't think I'm doing a good job, then um, go ahead and punish me by putting me back on the steering committee. If you think that uh, we need change or if you think that we're not doing the right thing, then it's time to send a signal and vote me off. And that's really my entire platform. So we'll see what happens tomorrow. Thanks. I forgot to put this in the slides, but it is definitely worth pointing out here that the people who are elected to the steering committee will become also uh, board members uh, for NUNOG, uh, replacing those who are not elected here. Um, so the intent is to keep them congruent throughout the, the life of, of the current NANOG organization. So it's kind of a double election, two for one. All right. Um, well, there is one charter amendment on the ballot. Um, this is the text in its entirety up here. Um, it basically uh, uh, lets Merritt wind down working on 
on Nanog and lets Nunog wind up working on Nanog. Um, it is an endorsement for the Nunog organization and expresses a desire of the community that we manage an orderly transition and transfer of the relevant intellectual property. So if you think this is a good idea, then please vote yes. If you think this is a bad idea, then go ahead and vote no, but recognize that after um, uh, the February meeting that won't leave anybody running Nanog, so that might not be the best thing to do. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that's it for the Charter Amendment. I suppose at this point I should ask if there's any questions on it um, or if, if it's pretty straightforward and we can go on. I don't see anybody jumping up, so let's go on. There is also a new NOG election happening at the same time, uh, thanks to our friends at Merit who are running that election for us. Um, we arranged things so that everybody who is eligible to vote in the NANOG election is considered a member of NUNOG and eligible to vote in that election. Um, that makes the logistics a whole lot easier. So when you go to the elections, the NANOG elections page, you'll see two links, one for the NANOG election, which has the SC ballot and the Charter Amendment ballot. Um, and you'll also see a link to the NUNOG election, which has this one question, which is, shall we adopt the bylaws um, that were produced by Steve Gibbard and, and his committee over a uh, period of the last few months. Um, if you vote yes on it, those draft bylaws are adopted and become the corporate bylaws. If you vote no, um, and if the election loses, uh, then the current bylaws, the ones that I put together um, really quickly over a weekend, uh, remain in effect. Um, so if you want some actual real well thought out bylaws, uh, vote for yes, please. Um, <clears throat> in either case, it's worth pointing out that the bylaws do allow for amendments um, so that any mistakes that are made in either case can be rectified um, over time. Um, and we didn't have to get everything absolutely perfect on the first try. And uh, there will be more about this later on during the new audit section. Um, so while we're here, any questions on the election process um, as opposed to the contents of the bylaws, which we'll get to in the later section? All right. That then is it for um, the NANOG section of this meeting. And now if you'll give me a moment, I am going to load on the slides that Sylvie gave me a moment ago, which we will. Hey, yes. <clears throat> which has some corrections on it. So let's do that. Here that. And uh, I, I'm sure I did. No, it's just not showing up. Oh, maybe. Ah, that's why. No, it helps if I do it right. There we go. There we go. Uh, sorry for the delay here, but let's get things right on the first try instead of waiting. Place. All right, you know, some days I don't like computers. Try this again. Yes, I want to replace it. Thank you. And okay, there we go. Slides. So transition report. Nunog. Um, as mentioned before, the name of the corporation today is Nunog. That is a placeholder name. Um, it will be replaced with a real name once we have rights to use a real name. Uh, we're going to talk about some milestones, um, things we've accomplished over the last few months, what we're going to be doing over the next few months, and then a lot of uh, reports from the working groups who do most of the real work. Okay. Um, we created five working groups. Um, as I said, I've been doing most of the real work behind the scenes to make things happen. Uh, the membership working group with Chris Foster as chair um, has been working on the membership uh, model. Um, the governance working group, chaired by Steve Gibbard, uh, is the, produced the bylaws that we're going to be uh, talking about a little later and voting on over the next couple of days. 
Um, we had input from the other groups as well. The development working group, uh, chaired by Chris Casada, has been working on a sponsorship model, making it so that we actually can have a revenue stream um, independent of uh, <coughs> meeting attendees um, over the next few years and have a sustainable organization. Um, which goes into the finance working group, chaired by Dan Golding, which has been working on a budget to actually show that these numbers are meaningful and that we can uh, make money. And the technical working group, uh, chaired by Raz, which will be working on uh, figuring out the uh, technical needs of the organization um, to support meetings, to support mailing lists, and, and other things that are needed over time. All right, that didn't do anything. Okay. Um, a few other things that have happened. Uh, on September 24th, we submitted the ap application to the IRS for 501c3 nonprofit status. Um, I should, uh, at this point, give a big thanks to Tom Daly and Dine Incorporated, um, who did all of the legwork to write the application. Um, it's a nice, huge, thick pile of paper. Uh, it has to be absolutely right so the IRS likes it and doesn't send it back. Um, so it's in. They've had it for a week and a half now, and we're hoping that they'll like it and, uh, and approve it. Um, it'll probably take us a month or two to find out. Um, we'll let you know when that happens. Um, the other big event that's happened in the last few weeks is that uh, we secured a loan. Um, Aaron has graciously offered to lend us some money to support uh, hiring an executive director, um, which is something that we need to do very quickly. And uh, we needed to be able to uh, pay the executive director for some reason. People like to get paid to do work, um, aside from us. And, and so this way we will be able to go out and hire somebody. Um, I'm not sure. It's on either of these pages. Uh, do, is there something that's coming up about the ED search? Or? Okay. So I'll, I'll wait until we get to the right spot to talk more about that. Um, here's the current state of the Nunog Treasury. Um, I don't know, do, Dwayne, do you have anything? Worth can I can read it just as well as you can. Okay. Um, basically what it says is that we, um, as of the time this slide was written, had about $5,300 in the bank. Um, all of our, almost all of our income has been from donations from people like you um, up until this point. And uh, our expenses have been a, a hotel deposit for Denver and the IRS application fee. Um, and then if you some fees to PayPal, I guess. Okay, here's what's going on next. Ah, oh, yes, executive director search. So we put out a uh, <clears throat> job description for an executive director. We're accepting applications now and through October 15th. Um, we've already received a few um, people interested, but if any of you are interested or know somebody who would be good uh, for the organization, um, go ahead and apply or encourage them to apply. Um, the more qualified candidates we have, it's more work, but it's better for everyone in the long run to have a, a good pool of candidates to select from. Um, we've uh, already started the interview process for the applications that we have already. Um, we are hoping that we can make a decision um, in, the, in the latter half of the fourth quarter um, and have whoever is selected fully on board and up and running uh, before the new year. Um, sooner than that, if things work out well. Um, if you're interested, look at the NUNOG website and, and you'll see a link to the job description there. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be uh, putting together a working group to uh, form an RFP for uh, association management slash meeting management um, services. I think there's a bit more on that here. Oh, there it is. Um, if you are interested in helping with the RFP, please send us mail and, and we'll gladly put you on the committee. Um, uh, Sylvie started working on it and discovered it's, it's a fairly large task to make sure everything gets enumerated properly. So the more eyes and the more hands in it, the, the better off we'll be. Um, the contract will be to provide association management services, um, which means dealing with the membership and the, uh, just the, the basic business aspects of it. Um, IT services, which means running the web server and the mailing list servers and whatever is needed to uh, run the, these meetings and uh, conference management services, which is things like meeting registration, dealing with the venues, and that sort of thing. So a lot more will be in the RFP, of course. Um, all right, now we'll get a progress report from the membership working group, and I believe Ren got uh, drafted to do that. No? Ren didn't get drafted to do that. So did? I'll let you do it.
I've been standing up here too long. <laughs> Hi, Joe Provo, steering committee, exiting. Um, basically, the membership working group, a large group of folks that had some uh, had discussions and a couple of conference calls to hammer out what the uh, membership structure is to fold into the bylaws. Um, the this is just a basic overview of um, there was a survey taken of the various member models used in different organizations. Um, the uh, feedback expected now is uh, expected to drive um, any uh, ratific ratified changes that would be necessary going forward if there if there is any. Um, and uh, they currently are part of the um, part of the existing bylaws uh, that we are being we're discussing in a few minutes. Um, there was uh, well. Sorry, I haven't read these. Um, basically, positioning ourselves for uh, for moving forward. Um, is I'm not sure if this is the, actually the current deck. I'm getting a strange feeling this was not. Um, well, that is the correct one. Um, that, that was that was all right. Thank you. Um, the there was discussion on Nanog Futures recently about the. Um, about the types of memberships, and you know, that's uh, I'm expecting somebody to come up and, and actually say something about that right now, but uh, I'm surprised there isn't. Um. Can, can I offer a son? Yes, this is on. Um, one technical correction here. I noticed the life number. Hi, Steve Gibbard, uh, Governance Working Group. Um, the I notice here we have the uh, life member listed as 10 times the annual membership dues, and I believe that was removed and left at the discretion of the board. That that was a that was an update. Yes, that that hard number doesn't exist. Next yeah, one, Joel Yegley. Um Yeah, sure. If you want somebody to come up and comment on it, um, I'll do that. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess I failed to get a rise out of anybody on 9-2 with my comment about that, so um, we had to go around in another cycle before that happened. That's okay. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure that I actually will vote against the uh, the bylaws as they as they stand today, so I, I wouldn't say that I'm wildly opposed to it. I just, um, you know, would have preferred different language. Um, that said, um, I guess that's you know, what I have to say on it. Um, I don't think the other bearded person is actually in Atlanta for this, so yeah. I doubt he will be uh, uh, communicating any more directly than he already has. Understood. And, and I do want to say that, that it's fully expected that the whole process is to be iterative and there will be stumbles. That's what happened when we did the Nanog Charter in 2005. It took many many years to get to something that we all thought was pretty functional and that made for a good platform on which uh, to start this process. Uh, Kevin? He's got a follow -up. Oh, sure. Hit it, Joel. All right. I think one of the things that we were quite successful at doing with the last charter um, and, you know, actually um, um, avoided in, few, in subsequent revisions doing um, was being uh, extremely specific. That is, we left things at the discrete apart, apart from the ability to uh, um, vote in program or uh, steering committee members and remove them and the powers um, contained in the steering committee. We left a lot of things up to the description or the discretion of, of the various organizations that were responsible for them. And I think that is um, a useful model uh, going forward. Um, that is, um, for example, in the membership case, um, you know, once you define design the things such that there are members and non-members, um, actual fee structures, for example, or something that gets left to the discretion of the steering committee and, and the membership committee if such a thing continues to exist. 
Without, good, good points, one and all. But uh, Kevin? Kevin Oberman from ESNet. Um, I've been coming to Nanog for a lot of years, as probably many of you know. Those others of you who have been coming for many years. Uh, for those who don't remember it, the logo you get on your t-shirts today wasn't always the Nanog logo. I, I'm wearing one of the old t-shirts. It's got the old logo on it. Uh, it consists of the name of the group, a necktie, the antecedents of which I will uh, fill in to anybody who really wants to know. Uh, and down at the bottom it says, Official Member. Um, yes, I know, that that's, was a bit of a joke at the time. But still, the reality is Nanog was founded in the idea of people who had an interest paid their money and came to Nanog. Thus, they were members. And that is still true as of today. Uh, your first statement up there talks about uh, demonstrated professional competence in Nunog designated fields of interest. Aside from the fact that there's enough weasel words in there to make a lawyer grin and smile happily, uh, I am utterly baffled at the need for this. Uh, particular designation. Um, I suppose maybe it's to keep the lawyers out, in which case maybe I'm for it. Uh, unfortunately, I'm afraid a lot of lawyers know enough about networking to sound vaguely competent and fool their way in. Generally, though, it, I, I, I really prefer to see membership as open as possible. And if you're willing to pay your money to come to Nanog meetings, I don't like to see the uh, additional overhead, so to speak, of becoming an Anog member. Whether that's required for meeting membership, I realize it's not, but it's required for voting and things. And I think Nanog should remain as open as possible. I, I like the open structure since the last revolution, not the current revolution, uh, and I'd like to see that sort of thing continue. I've been very quiet about this to this point since I am about to retire. I will probably be at a couple more Nanogs before I head out the door. Uh, but Betty twisted my arm last night and sort of said, hey, you care about Nanog, and if you do, get up and say something. So that's, that's why I'm saying something, and I've probably talked too long already. No, but valid, valid points, Kevin, and I, I think the, yeah, definitely. I think to your openness point, part of the idea of having a, um, a paid membership that is decoupled from required attendance is to actually reach out to more of our um, constituents, the whatever, 10,000 plus that are in the mailing list and, and, and other uh, folks that are currently not as um, active because they may not be able to travel. Uh, Dan? Sure. Uh, Dan Golding. Um, I was not part of the, uh, the membership working group, but as, as I understand it, a couple of points. One was I, I think the weasel words uh, were so that anyone who wanted to pay the money could qualify. Um, you, you know, when you become a nonprofit, you have to have some definition of membership, and there's a couple ways of doing it. But having something that sounds really good like that, yet weaselly enough, so that anyone here who wants to join or anyone else who wants to join can join, is is sort of the idea about having a really open membership. The, the only other way of doing it is something that says anyone who's really interested in topic area X is allowed to become a member. Um, but, but, you know, those are the ways to essentially have a valid Nonprofit organization yet have an open membership, um, and that's pretty much what this is. Um, I know some people are happy with the outcome of the membership working group, and other people are unhappy. Um, I, I think one of the things we're going to have to learn here is that when you have a working group of 14 or 15 people, we probably got the very best output capable from a working group of 14 or 15 people. And, and I, I think as organizations mature, they start to figure out that maybe. When you have huge groups, it's very hard to come to a consensus that pleases everyone. Um, I think people will see that we had other working groups that were smaller, and I think the output of those groups is probably going to cause much less of a of a big to do. And that may be because it's it's a lot easier to to come to a consensus when there's a smaller number of people. The, the other issue to keep in mind here as well, and I'll, I'll shut up, is that when you have working groups that have the job of coming up with specific deliverables. You know, the membership working group, you know, was much more pie in the sky, whereas things like the development working group that was about sponsorships or the budget working group that was about producing a budget, it was just a work process. I, I mean, you got to come up with a spreadsheet that says X or Y, and the numbers have to work. Um, with a membership working group, I, I think the best thing to do moving forward is to say, what are our lessons? Our lessons might be 
maybe not 14 or 15 people and maybe clear direction from the board and maybe more constrained choices. But, you know, that's, that's what you learn when you start a new organization, and that's what we're doing. Thanks, Dan. And, you know, the other controversial bits were having uh, – Having a fellow, I think, on Nanog Futures, uh, a fellow membership class. Uh, Nanog Futures, I think uh, Chris explained fairly well what the rationale there was in terms of being able to um, have a, uh, a recognition for outstanding uh, service to the community by, within our own uh, umbrella. Um, it is worth noting that you know, if it remains a, a hot topic, the board just doesn't have to actually add any fellows, and eventually the language could be struck, as in within the next within the next voting cycle. Um, you know, if it, the feedback will determine how that progresses. Um, Marty, is this on on this slide? Hi, Joe. Uh, Martin Hannigan. I'm a guy that wears many hats, actually, and that's pretty much as a result of Nanog, um, including a Red Sox hat, which, by the way, they smoked the Yankees today. Um, <laughs> Lots of Sox fans. I'm neutral with respect to Nanog to Nunog, so I won't really get in, into that too much. And um, I'm not subscribed to the Futures mailing list, so I don't really know what's transpired with relation to a discussion. Uh, I think I heard that Randy had made some... Um, rather interesting comments with regards to some of the topics that we're discussing here today. I, I guess I get the feeling with this membership stuff, I don't really support it. Um, I almost said obnoxious, and I guess I think that that would be insulting because you guys are doing a lot of hard work, and I do appreciate that. I don't think that I would be anywhere near where I am today without Nanog, and it's already hard enough to come to a Nanog meeting as a newcomer and meet people and learn things and participate. And I think that um, some of the language here really, at least in my opinion, seems to make that a little bit harder. I, I don't know why you guys decided to embark upon uh, this approach. I would be interested in hearing why in a sentence or two. And uh, I would just like to let you know that I don't support it. Thanks. I'll let um, – can RS actually address some of that? But the uh, the – um, w boilerplate was IEEE, so a lot of that comes out of there. And I know what you're talking well, – and the front-loading the front loading so of – sorry, let me just say the front-loading of the lifetime membership kind of stuff, that's to build the bank. Uh, you said you weren't on futures. That's – Dan actually explained that fairly well from the budgetary perspective. Um, and really, uh, I, I hear what you're saying about Nano helping to form a lot of our current skills and abilities. And I think the difficulty in travel is a very compelling reason to move to a membership model that allows people that can't necessarily make it participate in, in a way. I think it's worth um, noting that the purpose of membership is so that we have a, a pool of people who are eligible to vote on corporate matters, not – to, uh, at least in my mind, this is my opinion, um, not to a, a set of people who are eligible to come to meetings or to participate on the mailing list or whatever. Um, those are, should, in, in my mind, be no way coupled, and I don't think any of us tries to do that. Um, there are two other things that membership model can do. One of them is a revenue stream, which is always a good thing in my mind. Um, the third thing, which I think has been tossed around a bit, though I don't know um, what how much it was really talked about, and that is to come up with a, a way of possibly recognizing one's peers. Um, certainly, there, IEEE has a, a membership model where you, you join and, and you have to be recognized as an engineer and, and so on. Um, I don't know if we want to go down that route or not, but uh, maybe it's a worthwhile discussion to have. And, and something like that would end up telling us what kind of membership model we really want. But things to keep in mind are we do need members so that we can have people who can vote. Um, that's important. Um, and uh, the revenue stream from said members is, is, is a good thing. And speaking of revenue stream, while, while, there, while there's some more comments coming along. John Springer, Inland Telephone. Um, am I correct in assuming that we are all members? For all the people in this room? Mm -hmm. At present, that is the definition of the membership within the, within the bylaws. For the very first election, everybody is a member. For and after that, the first election, you have, to be a, uh, you have to join to be a member. 
So that hasn't been explicitly stated before now, at least that I was paying attention to. So the whole business about anybody can vote who's attended a NANOG meeting in the last two years comes to an end Wednesday? Yes. Yes. If we pass the ‑‑ yes. Actually, it ends whether we pass the bylaws or not. Well, the new bylaws don't state. The current bylaws, I should say. Let me have my ‑‑ The current bylaws are very unspecific about that. They only say that the board determines the qualifications for membership and just leaves it at that. The idea was to write a very minimal set of bylaws that would pass muster for incorporation and let us do our work for the first six months or so until we have this election. And just a quick clarification question. Who are you? I'm Bill Norton. I'm an attendee of NANOG. Just a clarification question. This is a bylaws vote thumbs up and thumbs down. The thumbs up is accepting the membership structure as it is. There's no separate voting question on the membership. Is that correct? Unfortunately, yes. It's an up and down on the bylaws. This is Rob Seastrom. I keep trying to get the microphone. So the first ‑‑ I wanted to ask Marty a clarifying question so it's convenient that he stepped up to the microphone. Telepathy. Your question about why we had the multiple type of membership sort of thing set up or why we chose the membership structure at all. Membership structure overall. Okay. So one of the things that you run into when you're running into, I guess, association, although I don't like to use that word because it's nuanced as a term of art, nonprofit organizations in general, like, for instance, your credit union, you have to have certain attributes to be a member of the credit union. You know, you have to be a resident of the city of Cambridge or you have to work for MIT or you have to, you know, something. When we did this for a particular nonprofit that I'm on the board of, it was you have to be an instructor with these credentials and pay a $5 yearly membership fee. And as Steve was saying earlier, that's to provide a group of people who are legally qualified to vote for the board of directors or trustees or whatever. Okay. That makes complete sense to me. So let me just offer you a few more points of information. Okay. So first of all, I am going to vote yes to adopt all of this stuff that you guys are talking about because I think that you can always pluck a turd out of the punch bowl, so to speak. I think I'm going to have to put that in my list of quotes, actually. But secondly, I, and I will take the step of saying I do find the membership classifications obnoxious and perhaps you could just make a membership that we pay 50 bucks and get a card that says Whoopi Nanog and that we can go to like Micro Center and get a discount or something. I, I, but that might cheapen it as well. I mean, there's a balance that needs to be established with whatever membership approach that you take, but I think this is a little bit over the top. Gotcha. Thank you for volunteering for the membership working group. We'll expect you on the. If you'd like to give me 20 percent of my time at work every week to work on the membership working group, I'd love to do it. Thank you. No. I will say, again, I can't speak for the whole board, but at least for myself, there seems to be sufficient disagreement on this topic that I think we're going to have to go back to the drawing board and figure out what the membership model should look like. At least from my perspective, I still think it's worth voting for the bylaws, assuming that that's the only issue that you have with them. This is kind of for everybody. And at least for myself as a board member, I will pledge to go ahead and revisit the membership thing and submit something to the community later that we can discuss. And also to not do anything that would make that impossible later, like electing a dozen fellows next week or anything like that. Matt Petak from Yahoo. If we pass the bylaws as amended, we all cease to be members Wednesday afternoon. How would we vote for change at that point? So you have an established pay this amount of cash and suddenly you get to vote for change? Excellent. Well, that is that it. 
What are you, you, I need two microphones. You, you do. Um, uh, the answer to your question is if you vote for the new bylaws, then yes, that is in there. If you pay a hundred bucks or whatever the number is, uh, then you get to be a member and vote in future elections. If you do, if the new bylaws are not voted in, then the language that's in the bylaws says that the, the board gets to set rules for being members and we can do whatever we feel like. Um, so that may give you an incentive to vote for the, the new ones. Uh, I'd, I'd like to re-emphasize the point that was made earlier. Uh, I think Joe made the point that um, better is the enemy of good enough, and we're, the question is, are we moving in a positive direction sort of incrementally as we reevaluate our uh, our rules and our uh, membership qualifications and all that other stuff year over year? We've certainly had charter amendments Every year except, every meeting except for one, every year except for one. Uh, and so I fully expect that there will be a plethora of charter amendment proposals next year and the year after. Uh, I, I certainly don't think any of my colleagues here are, are representing that we're getting it 100% right the first time. And uh, we are very keen to hear, especially after a little bit of, of watching and seeing how it works, uh, recommendations and suggestions from the whole community on how to improve it. Go ahead. Uh, David Farmer, University of Minnesota. Um, I think there's uh, the point that was made that this is about eligibility for voting is an important one. And while I may have some concerns about that, when I first just looked at this and not had seen all the stuff, it didn't look like it was just about eligibility for voting. It felt like it was about who could participate and how they can. I understand. You understand you're, now, but but I, I, I hear you. I hear yeah, you. and what I'm saying is you need to make that more clear. And that's not something that needs to go in the bylaws. It's just how we talk about it, how we do it, how we communicate it. How we put it on the mailing list. That yeah. This is all about just the membership that is yeah. basically the people that care enough to be in this room, we yeah. expect to be kind of the bucket of the membership. Yeah. The, people that, the people that don't care to participate in the process, they can still do everything. They just don't have to be laden with <laughs> this. And so the, the, the only thing that I wanted to just mention that, that relates to that is also when you used the, said the IEEE was the example. That's not the case in the IEEE. So that's an important distinction between what you're talking about and the IEEE model. I hear you. If I said example, that was an error. It was yeah. boilerplate is what I meant for, okay, yeah, for yeah, the yeah, actual not. tiers. And well, and, but in, in whatever you said is fine, but too, but I recognized it. And that's part of the baggage that comes along with recognizing it is, gotcha. the, is the model. If you're using that as a model, that's part of the baggage. Gotcha. Understood. One more from the floor. Yeah, uh, just a question, Michael Sinatra, UC Berkeley. Um, is there an intent to um, provide discounts for meeting fees, registration fees for NANOG members? That, while not codified in anything that we are that, that that's currently on the table or for vote, that's definitely been you know, gosh, okay, if we do membership, it's voting. Gosh, that sounds not like a win. Sometimes that sounds like more work. So things like, you know, extending what is the equivalent of early bird or, um, you know, th there, there are a lot of different things that are part and parcel of the intent of the, the membership working group after we've actually got the structure, A, streamlining it so that the membership is happy, the community is happy with what the membership is, and B, defining what a bunch of the benefits are. So discounts to meetings is an obvious one, whether it's, you know, discounts at Micro Center or something or deal with O'Reilly, whatever. Um, but that, that, as far as the board is concerned, is a, is a wide open field. So just a comment based on that um, and based on some of the other comments that have been made. If you are going to do that, it, it, you have to be very careful to make sure that the there is still a certain amount of decoupling between the membership and the participant notion that you're not extending so many benefits to members that you feel like you have to be a member just to participate. Um, so I know that's hard, and no, I'm not volunteering to help out to define it. How did, how did you know what I was going to say? Uh, but, but, you know, on the flip side, we will want to make the membership uh, benefits interesting enough where some of the people that may not be interested in this room but might 
find it interesting to you know make a little make a little uh, a worm on the hook to dangle. I, I think one of the ideas that was sort of bandied about was the idea that if you go to a certain number of Nanog conferences a year, that you know at some point you hit break even with your membership fee. That was sort of discussed in general. But I just want to say I, I endorse the micro center discount idea. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah, fr fries too. Fries. There we go. <laughs> And I see one more. Right. I mean, I think, Joel Yegley again, I think one of the exercises with um, having a paid membership is that, um, you know, obviously when eligibility changes, there are people who participate in the Nanana community who do not attend the meetings. Um, some of them are trolls. Um, but they can now become part of the... Uh, the Nanog process by becoming members. Exactly. I think I, I tried to say that, but I didn't say it as succinctly earlier. Um, while we were having this discussion, I left I left the uh, the previous financial slide up and and flipped to this one because, well, staring at a slide of numbers isn't always the best way to actually analyze numbers. So please feel free to look at the presentation when it's online. Is it online now? It will be after the session. It will be after the session. And how can you help? <laughs> Give Dwayne money. <laughs> no, but uh, participate in the process. Uh, we have been saying all along, it is expected to be iterative, and there will be refinement as we go. Thanks. Okay. We didn't skip anything, did we? We are actually on track. Okay. All right. Next up is the governance uh, progress report, which will be Steve, Gib Steve Gibbard, who has done all the work um, herding cats to get some bylaws produced. Hi, so um, I'm here representing the governance working group. We actually had a, a pretty large mail. We threw the working group open to anyone who wanted to join. We ended up with a pretty large mailing list. And I'm not going to list all the lurkers here. I went through quickly before the meeting to just try to um, make sh to attempt to make sure I had a complete list of those who had actually commented in the discussion and. Um, this is what I came up with in like two minutes of looking over the list on my iPhone. So if I missed anyone who was involved, I apologize for that. Um, but anyway, so the uh, so we created the draft bylaws, which uh, which I think a lot of you have looked at. Um, we were responsible for everything in there except for the membership section, which we can you know say. Hey, that, we, we have no responsibility for that at all. Um, that was created by the membership working group. Um, and for the non-membership portion, which is what we were responsible with, it was mostly a document merge of the existing NANOG charter and the temporary NUNOG bylaws that were created by, I guess, NUNOG's attorney and Steve Feldman. So basically, we tried to take the nonprofit boilerplate out of that and the otherwise the, the structure out of the existing NANOG charter. Um, we did make a few changes. Um, there is an elected board that actually has authority as opposed to the steering committee that was advisory to merit. Um, we've added this executive director position who um, I guess is somebody who's going to do a lot of the things that merit used to do for, for NUNOG. And the executive director will also serve as a board member. Partly this was a way to um, elect a the same number of board members every year and still end up with an odd number for um, for tie-breaking. And partly it was just felt that the executive director would have enough of a stake in this that they should have that authority. Um, we, um, the executive director is selected by the, um, the elected members of the board. So um, we still have flexibility in there if the executive director is doing something the board really disapproves of to uh, the elected people really disapprove of for them to remove that person. So it doesn't really make the executive director a whole, a whole lot more powerful than they otherwise would be. Um, we added a couple of extra committees. The, um, the existing charter had the program committee, the communications committee, which does the mailing list, and um, the sponsorship committee, I believe. Um, 
maybe it was just those two, I forget. But anyway, we added the, uh, the membership and development committee, which is going to be responsible for fundraising, either through memberships or sponsorships. And the budget and finance committee, which as its name suggests, is going to be responsible for budgeting. Um, and the other, the other point that I would make here is we tried hard to make this very amendable because we assumed that we got a lot of things wrong. So five years ago, I think it was, when we were working on the existing NANOG charter, we stuck in a clause that said that the members of NANOG, which at the time was defined as everybody who'd been to meeting in the last two years, could amend the charter with um, some small percentage of the membership putting something on a ballot and then a majority vote at the annual election. Um, this time we kept that provision. Obviously it goes to the new definition of membership um, to amend that. And then we also added another temporary clause for the first year just in case we got something really wrong right off the bat or perhaps more likely in case the IRS came back and said you have some provision in here that's incompatible with 501c3 and you need to change it or your contributions won't be tax deductible. So we added the second provision in there which says that if the board, the bylaws can be amended temporarily if the board votes unanimously to change them um, and the temporary amendment will be good until the next annual election a year from now at which point the membership would have to ratify the amendment or else it would revert. So I think what I'm hearing from this discussion right now has been, well, I guess you guys haven't had the chance to start throwing uh, the Aaron fake tomatoes at me yet. Uh, but as far as, I, as far as I can tell from what's going on on the mailing list, it sounds like there's a lot of uh, complaints about, you know, a lot of opinions probably on both sides about what the membership working group came up with. And nobody seems to care nearly as much about the rest of what's in here. Uh, but so I, I think what I'm hearing from this is that if you guys vote yes on the bylaws here and yet nobody likes the membership section, we have a process in here whereby that membership provision can be temporary and can be changed to pretty much anything that um, anybody who pays $100 for, anybody who cares enough to pay $100 to be able to vote can go change later. Um, so the, the current membership stuff, if it's really unpopular, is there for at most the next year. And anything else in here that we get wrong again, if this gets approved, can be changed a year from now. So hopefully that means that uh, um, that people can go ahead and approve this and then go change it later and deal with whatever the, uh, whatever the criticisms are. I um, think that's about it for what I have to say. Uh, any, I see Bill Norton is jumping up. And any other questions, comments, uh, throwing tomatoes, uh, now would be the time. I guess I'm just wondering, um, Steve, I really appreciate what you said about the uh, taking to heart the um, uh, concerns folks have raised about the membership. Um, and I, I appreciate we're putting our, our faith <coughs> in, in, in you and the steering committee to uh, go ahead and make some changes uh, or at least take a look at the membership um, rules. I guess I'm, I'm thinking through the, the process. Uh, we, we vote thumbs up for the bylaws. Um, accepting that the steering committee might um, go back to scratch with respect to the membership um, rules. But you do have the issue of um, who, who pays uh, membership fees now and lifetime fees and, and this other stuff. Maybe you put the fellow stuff aside and just forget about the fellow stuff altogether. Uh, but will you accept the lifetime fees with the essentially a contract that by accepting lifetime fees for 10 years, people won't have to, I guess for the rest of their life, they won't have to pay whatever membership fees come up. So one of the, uh, you know, one of the features that we tried to keep in mind both five years ago with the charter and now is that the things that you really need to set in stone are the voting process and the, you know, who, who gets to be on the board because if you have a dispute about who your board is, then you can get, you know, into a lot of, you know, really intense power struggles. Whereas if you know who has the authority, then somebody can make a decision. So at this, so the membership stuff, you know, the, the various classes of membership are in there. The appointment of fellows and the setting of fees and all that was left to the board. 
So I think, you know, as far as what happens to the fees for a lifetime membership, um, does that stuff get accepted now? I, you know, I, I suppose the board could either, you know, decline to set a fee for lifetime membership or if that's not practical, set the fee so high that nobody would possibly pay it um, if they wanted to take that off the table for the moment. Uh, beyond that, I guess, you know, as far as what would go into an amendment and whether those people would be amended out of their membership or something, I think that's really up to how the amendment gets worded and the voters next time around. And I don't know that I can speak for the NANOG voters on that. Uh, I, I think what that does lead to is you know, who you elect to the board is important. I don't think there's anybody on the current candidate list who looks like they'll be really nefarious. But uh, um, and you know how this next amend how this next amendment gets worded and uh, whether it gets voted for is also important. But hopefully we can trust our whoever gets elected to the board and the membership that does that voting enough to you know hope that we get a reasonable outcome out of that. So let's be really clear here. This is a membership organization. Um, even if the board changes it, it has to be ratified by the membership the next vote, right? First of all. Second of all, there's nothing stopping the membership from changing it. Whatever the board decides to pick the fees at, you guys get upset, you send a membership, uh, an amendment, somebody pays their thousand bucks or whatever it is, and it, they could be turned around the next time anyway just by the whole membership. It doesn't have to be just the board. Everything is fluid. This is true whether it's NANOG or your housing association or somebody teaching you how to shoot guns for something. They, we either have faith in the organization or we don't. Uh, and if you worry about it, then pay the 100 bucks and don't worry about the lifetime. If you have faith in it, then and you think that your fellow members, your fellow attendees, your fellow people who will vote on the next amendment are not going to do something evil to you, then you know step up and get a discount if you're planning to be here more than 10 years or if you'd like to give the organization some money in some way or something like that. I don't think these are really problems that we should be uh, desperately worried about. It's okay to like discuss if you want, but if anybody's really worried about the fact that, oh, well, if they set it for a thousand bucks, they could change it because a full election of the, uh, a unanimous vote of the board could change the bylaws and remove my lifetime membership. If that's really what you're worried about, then I think that you don't have faith in the entirety of NANOG because that means that you think the rest of the people in this room and out in the hallways and on the mailing list are going to ratify an amendment that's going to in some way hurt you. And I, I personally don't feel that way about the rest of the people that, you know, I trade mail with a lot, even though some of them really don't like me. I still don't even feel that way about them. So hopefully you guys don't either. Don Welch, Merit Network. Um, you made a statement earlier that the uh, executive director would serve at the pleasure of the board, uh, and therefore limiting the power of the executive director. Uh, the board is going to be term limited, so they're going to rotate periodically. The executive director will theoretically have some long uh, some uh, longevity within the organization. Um, you're going to have probably, it looks like, uh, two professional staff, the executive director and an assistant is what I've seen so far. So I would submit the executive director is going to be incredibly powerful because the institutional knowledge of running the organization is going to reside in the executive director. Uh, especially with a uh, uh, with short term limits on the on the board, so you may want to consider that balance of power. Thanks. So the ED is going to be amazingly powerful because he's not he or she will not only be you know everything Don said, but he's also going to have a seat on the board. Pardon me if I keep saying he. Obviously, we have um, uh, absolutely no preference for that. Nobody sued me because I said he. So um, the but we believe that we can uh, we can satisfy the uh, balance of power correctly. And having been on uh, nonprofit boards, in fact, existing nonprofit boards that have term limits and, you know, very powerful CEOs and things like that, um, I don't see it as a problem if you make the right choice. Plus, remember, uh, we say they serve at the uh, pleasure of the board, but the membership is the final straw. Anybody really hates the ED, they can make an amendment that says we fire the ED, and there's nothing the board can do about it if the membership votes on it. Remember, you guys have all the power. We're just doing this because, honestly, you guys don't have time. Neither do we, but you guys don't have time. But um, you, you guys have all the power. At the end of the day, if you really don't like something, 
Just float an amendment, get people to vote for it, and it's done, and there's not a goddamn thing anybody up here can do about it. Yeah, nor, nor would we want to. Okay, seeing no one else, uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Steve. Let's see, we have more things to talk about, so let's move on. Um, the development working group, uh, Chris couldn't be here, um, but I think, uh, Sylvie, did you volunteer to talk about development? So the, on the development and working group, uh, it was led by Christopher Casada with Betty Burke, Valerie Whitcuff as the members. And what they come up with, I'm sorry, is what they were first uh, tasked with is to f find additional sponsorship for 2011-2012, so to get a proper structure in place. So what they decided is that there would be little change. Uh, from an, an attendee's point of view, so the beer and gear system still remains. The breaks also remain the same. And the marketing or the sales uh, will continue to be minimized. We, we want this to remain NANOG. What they've introduced is a greater flexibility for sponsors. And this, is, um, this came from the feedback that the marketing committee received uh, over the past two years. So they came up with a sponsorship structure that allows um, um, sponsors to provide money for a calendar year and not necessarily couple it to sponsoring just one event or one break. So those are the changes that they've introduced into the structure. And that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvie. And next up, we have Dan to talk about the finance working group. I'll try to make this as exciting as the membership stuff. So uh, the finance stuff's really thrilling. Who? Yeah. So finances are good. Yeah, so uh, the finance group was, was a little bit smaller than some of the others. Uh, it was myself, Bill Norton, Mike Smith, uh, Tom Daly, uh, with Dwayne and Sylvie, helped us out in terms of, uh, of being a liaison with the board. Uh, we did do an open request for membership, but uh, this not being as exciting or controversial didn't get quite as many folks. Um, our mission, our remit, was twofold. Uh, one is we had to create a budget. Uh, this is a cash budget for an independent NANOG organization starting immediately, as in today, uh, really starting about three months ago, and running through the end of 2012. Um, we worked with the membership and development working groups to get inputs from them on what kind of membership revenue we could expect, what kind of sponsorship revenue we could expect, um, and the other part of it, and that budget is done. Um, you know, we're waiting for board approval before it gets published. Um, a, a lot of people have seen it. If anyone else here wants to see it, it's in a flash drive in my pocket. I'm happy to show it to you after uh, this, this meeting concludes. It's thrilling. You know, it's, it's a budget. Um, the other part of our mission is to create uh, financial controls and systems. Um, these financial controls are designed to ensure that organization funds are being properly handled um, and to work with the treasurer to select and deploy a financial management system. Um, in terms of our status, the budget is complete. It's been submitted with a nonprofit application. Uh, the board is approving at this conference, hopefully. Um, and because we coordinated with all the other groups, I, th I think it's been a pretty successful process. Uh, for the financial controls aspect, that was a secondary priority. We had to get the budget done for the, the nonprofit application and also so the people here this, this week could see it. Pardon me. Um, efforts are, are, are ongoing for financial controls and systems. Uh, Tom Daly is coordinating that work. Um, so how did we come up with the budget? Um, on the revenue side, we worked very closely with the membership group to figure out what the probable membership numbers and dues are, and if it, um, if it reassures anyone, like 95% of the membership revenue was coming from regular non-special memberships where people were paying their $100 a year and becoming a member for a year, and that was it. Uh, we did work in some lifetime memberships, uh, which is essentially just sort of a forward donation to the group. Um, 
unknown how many people are actually interested in doing that, um, you know, particularly in light of the fact there seems to be some, you know, hard spots about it. Um, and we put in some student memberships into the budgets that were discounted um, because students have no money. Um, we also provided a sounding board for the development working group. Uh, as they worked, they created about eight or nine different sponsorship models. Eventually, uh, we helped them select the most conservative financial models, one for 2011. Uh, there's two conferences in 2011, a separate one for 2012. The sponsorship models were extremely conservative in terms of the revenue generated, and I really have no doubt that we'll be able to hit those numbers without too much of a problem. The expense side uh, was considerably trickier. Um, we really have pretty limited data on what NANOC conferences cost to run. Uh, we, we, in the aggregate, we know. We know how much merit has spent on all of these conferences. But if you attempt to sort of slice the salami and figure out, you know, which piece goes into which particular bucket, bucket um, because of the way merit was ad merit administered NANOG as a program, we don't really have a lot of, of super detailed financial knowledge. But because we have the sort of larger aggregate numbers, we can sort of see, is the revenue going to be able to, to meet the expense numbers? We were extremely conservative on the expense side. Assume it, we did not assume any cost savings at all. And in fact, we assumed uh, considerable costs above and beyond what goes on today. So very, very conservative. Um, and we also included a large budgetary buffer for all line items. This is not a eight line item budget. This is a 50 line item budget with, with a great deal of detail and a great deal of buffer. Um, now, some areas are not going to be clear until we run a conference. Um, until we can actually take the bills and do a lot of analysis of the bills that come in, we won't be able to do the really fine, fine grain budgeting that we'd like to do, um, but we're still pretty confident. Now, one question is, did we do this in a smoke-filled room? Uh, the answer is very much no. Uh, there was great public, there was a public invitation for working group participation. The only requirement was financial or accounting knowledge. I'm sorry that was a requirement, but this is a finance and budget working group. Um, all the volunteers, uh, they sort of figured out if they had the knowledge required. All the volunteers were accepted. Um, and those volunteers included folks who are, you know, CTOs who have P&L responsibility today. Um, you know, Bill, who was a former NANOG chair and who has an MBA. Myself, I, I work in finance, although I've come from the engineering side. Um, we did lots of collaboration with the other working groups, including some live collaboration on IRC, Google Docs, and email. Um, if you're dissatisfied with how this is done, I'm interested in recruiting you as a new volunteer. Um, what I'm not interested in is people like trolling. I don't think that's particularly cool. But if you really are interested in helping out, um, some of the work that went on is, you know, some of the members of the working group went line by line. I created most of the budget. We had guys like Mike Smith who went line by line correcting my math. We had Bill who went through and said, you're forgetting this or you're forgetting that or what about this or what about that and played a devil's advocate. Um, we had people who provided tremendous value. Um, and I think that's really important. It was a small group, but a group where all the members contributed pretty spectacularly to the success. And I can look at the, the budget and say that line item is Bill's and that line item is Mike's and that line item is mine. Um, and I, I think we did a reasonably good job. Um, in terms of what were the most contentious or difficult issues, certainly which sponsorship model to use. Um, right now, NANOG is kind of run on an a la carte sponsorship model. I buy a table at the Beer and Gear, or I buy a, a break. That's sort of non-standard for how most of the conference industry works. Most folks have the sort of familiar bronze, silver, gold memberships. Um, one of the things that the development group decided we helped them with was going from the a la carte model in 2011 to the more standard conference model in 2012. Um, no one here will probably notice a difference, but the sponsors will notice, and, and they prefer a more standard approach. It's much easier for them to get approval for and much easier for them to budget for. Um, the staffing levels of the organization uh, were difficult, uh, certainly a small staff um, augmented by, by one or two events assistants. Um, we feel is probably all we need. Um, we put in some hooks in the budget for association management. We don't know how much association management or event management will cost, um, but those hooks are in the budget so that when we get an idea of what the costs are, we can pull some of the money out of how much it costs to run the event or how much it costs to do IT and roll that up, up into association management. Um, 
The big question we had to ask, and, and this is something that I, I didn't go into assuming an answer one way or the other. I don't think any of the folks on the working group did. Uh, the big question is, is the new NANOG financially viable? I went in, actually, if I had any bias, my bias was that it wasn't financially viable until it was proven to be financially viable. Um, I think that was all of us. I, I, I know Bill and, and Tom and Mike were all very skeptical, and we were ready to say to the board, this is not going to work. Um, after doing the budget, um, we're pretty sure that provided everything comes together, provided there are sponsorships, provided, um, you know, there is a membership in reasonable numbers, provided uh, the bylaws are approved, provided all that stuff happens, um, we're reasonably sure that this is viable and we're reasonably sure that, that it's not only viable, but it's not like viable by $10. That once things are up and running, it's viable by several hundred thousand dollars a year, um, which is uh, the necessary buffer and reserve that you need to actually run an organization going forward for when you do have a bad event or for when you do have some kind of, you know, act of God, whatever the case is. So we're pretty confident. Uh, if you'd like to see the budget, please, 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 after this meeting, um, I'm happy to show it to you and share it with you. Um, it, again, it is a thrill. So any questions? Come on, I, I know this isn't membership. I know this isn't whether we have fellows or not. But this is way, way, way more important. Uh, David Farmer, University of Minnesota. Hmm? The association management. Um, are you looking for a for-profit company to do that? Or do you have in mind a non-profit company doing that? Some other organization doing that? What, you know, what's the thought there? Um, I'll, I'll let Sylvie address this one. Uh, this will be a part of the RFP, so we're putting out an RFP for association management, IT, and also uh, conference management. So the RFP will be open, so it could be a for-profit, not-for-profit. We don't have any pre-concluded uh, conception about that. Yeah, and and I, I just want to say that um, it is possible to do everything ourselves um, if we feel like reinventing the wheel, but a lot of things like conference websites, the, the actual organization website, um, you know, accounting services, legal services, um, you know, if you've got a, a you know, service organization that does this for 100 or 500 other, you know, similar nonprofits, they tend to get really good at it. Um, and a good example of this is the ITF utilizes a, a firm that does this for them, and it, it allows you not to have a huge professional staff, which is something that I think everyone wants to avoid. Um, I think we want to keep this really lean and not some ridiculous bureaucracy. Hey, Dan, good work. Um, I like it, and I just I had a few questions for you. Um, sure. I just want to note also, Jeff Pulver started Bond just like this. He bootstrapped it, so mm -hmm. it's not impossible. Mm -hmm. um, if your buckets don't fill like you anticipate, what's your contingency plan? Do you have a line of credit or are you able to obtain a line of credit? Because if the buckets fall short and you take money to, you take attendance fees and you're going to have to hold the meeting, uh, it would be catastrophic failure if we didn't. And I would expect that perhaps you may not actually realize as much revenue as you expect the first time out the gate and that it would be reasonable to buffer some of that with a line of credit and just wanted to get some of your thoughts. Around That's that. actually a great question. I, I could not have set that up better if I tried. Um, one of my biggest concerns about the organization was how do we get enough money initially to fund it until things actually kick in because, you know, I, I think a lot of people involved with this were just under the assumption we can hire an executive director and we can do X and Y and Z and the money will sort of fall from the sky. Well, I'm a pessimist, and I, I don't believe money falls from the sky. Um, you know, that's you need to get money from somewhere. Um, Aaron was kind enough um, to extend a, a good-sized loan to the organization. Thank you, Aaron. Um, the, the purpose of the loan was to fund the executive director position, which, to be honest, is uh, the single biggest liability um, the organization has. Almost everything else is sort of success-based, especially in terms of the events. Uh, but one of the things we made sure to do was when looking at the sponsorships and, and looking at the membership w and looking at the conference attendees was, in fact, to assume that the numbers would actually be worse than they are today. So when we put in budgeted numbers for how many attendees come from a con to a conference, um, they'll all actually be worse than this reality today. 
Um, when we put in numbers for sponsorships, they're actually worse than this conference today. Um, we think we could actually do quite a bit better uh, through a few common sense things, but, but we tried to be very disciplined and say, well, you know, the people in the working group said, we're not going to assume that we will be 1% more efficient. We will not assume that we are, are better at selling, uh, you know, attendee spots or, or sponsors. We'll assume we're worse. Um, so between that very generous loan coming from Aaron, and by the way, I also on the flash drive is the amortization schedule for that loan, if anyone would like to look. Um, it's very, very generous. Um, between that and between the extremely conservative assumptions we made, um, we're pretty safe. And, and the, the assumptions are, are so conservative that in 2011 and 2012, the, the, the event actually runs, not the event, but the organization actually runs a hundred to $200,000 surplus. Um, that's how conservative we were. Sir? Oli, Oli Jacobson with Cisco. Mm -hmm. I, I think this is great, and I really like the fact that you have um, sponsorship sort of uh, uh, regularized, or whatever you want to call that. Uh, the one caveat I will just warn you about is that there are certain organizations that are very, uh, very much like to host uh, events in their hometown or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the problem we have in the IETF. Maybe since this is North America, you won't have that problem, but I want to warn you about it. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it is an issue. Um, Chris Casada who sadly could not be here for this meeting due, due to work reasons, um, is, is pretty slick with this stuff. And when he built the sponsorship model, he made sure that if, if you wanted a particularly significant privilege of that sort, that you're going to pay for it. Now, he assumed, he was conservative enough in his assumptions that he assumed that no one would pay for it. But if someone actually chooses to, um, they'll be paying out the nose. Um, you, you know, he also took the, the step of actually approaching many of our current sponsors and asking them, you know, do you like it like X or do you like it like Y? You know, how do you want the sponsorship model to look? He didn't say how much do you want to pay, but he certainly said, you know, wh what kind of structure do you prefer and how far in advance do you want to know how much things are going to cost? And, and, you know, so he got into a situation where right now in a lot of cases, um, NANOG gets what's left in company sponsorship budgets because, you know, the, the venues historically haven't been decided way in advance, and because it's sort of non-standard, it's not what event coordinators are used to seeing, um, we get kind of leftovers. Um, but Chris really structured it so that these are now numbers that will be put in people's budgets for planning purposes, and I, I, I believe, you know, no data, but I believe that this will result in a lot more revenue for the organization. We did not plan on that, but it's a pretty reasonable assumption. Mike Joseph, Google. Um, in some uh, nonprofits that I've been involved with, uh, there's often provisions uh, to limit the signing authority of the executive. And I assume, uh, and I realize this may also border on governance, but uh, you're up there. Um, so I assume that the executive director would have primary signing authority for the association. Um, the concern I have is are there pro I didn't I skimmed over the bylaws I didn't mm -hmm. notice any provisions that would limit uh, the amount of liability the ED could undertake on behalf right. of the organization or the mm -hmm. time time duration of such liability. Right, it's relatively unusual in organization bylaws to put in uh, financial controls. Those are normally maintained in a separate document. Um, and and the the now that we've done the budget, the next piece of the pie, the next piece of the puzzle is definitely to, to write that financial controls document. Um, and, you know, I'm very open to any input from anyone. Probably what we're going to do is look at similar organizations and see what they do. Uh, certainly the executive director will have single signature authority up to a point. You know, up to some level, be it 5,000, be it 25,000, and past that they will need to get a second signature from someone else be it the treasurer of the organization, be it, uh, you know, the, the head of the board of directors. Um, you know, that document has yet to be written, but, we're, you know, to be honest, we're just going to find what the best practice is amongst nonprofits and go with it. And we're, we're going to have it legally reviewed as well. And I'm, I'm hoping I can jump the line and mm -hmm. answer that on behalf of um, the bylaws. Um, the intent in the bylaws on that, I, I don't have the, the language in front of me, and I think we were pretty vague on it, but certainly the intent was that 
final authority on everything was with the board and that the board would presumably decide what those limits are. So, All right, thanks. Those, type of, um, those types of limits are, um, even if we put them in the bylaws, would not, be, uh, would not be binding. If we hire a bad ED and the ED goes and signs a million dollar contract with something, it'll be legally binding no matter what our bylaws say. So unfortunately, you know, we're gonna put those limits in, but just like any organization, whether it's for profit, nonprofit, or otherwise, those types of things, you know, don't go into whatever we say in the bylaws is not going to stop a PO from going through to Cisco if they decide to buy a dozen CRSs. So we have to um, be sure we hire the right people and have the right cost controls in place, and you know, good relationships with our vendors and et cetera, et cetera. We'll do that. And John's going to go ahead and say that he can sign for anything he wants. <laughs> John, how much can you sign for? Um, I'm going to ignore that. So, <laughs> Um, Aaron has uh, agreed to put a loan note to Nunog uh, for uh, quarterly for six quarters, uh, 18 months, um, at $30,000 a month. It's an interest-bearing note at 2% that begins to return payments 25 months after initiation. Um, as part of that, each quarterly payment, which is effectively the money required for executive director and benefits, each quarterly payment is contingent upon a progress report that shows appropriate uh, progress, and that includes obviously financial controls. So an ED that um, sort of turns left and, and um, completely leaves the field of play uh, we'll find out that 90 days later, the next loan installment from Aaron won't be available. So since that's materially a great amount of the funding that, that uh, Nunog has in the first 18 months or so, I'm, I guess um, the loan note with Aaron ensures certain amounts of respectable financial controls because I couldn't counterspend it otherwise. Yeah. And, and the controls are very reasonable. They, they essentially uh, ask for things like audited financial statements, which um, it's all this stuff that we should be doing anyway. Um, I apologize. This is so small. This is why I didn't do this in the first place. This is the Aaron Note amortization table. Um, but suffice to say, they're giving us a really good deal. Uh, Pat Thanudo, cash strap student. Um, one of the things that occurs to me is that the membership as it exists is very much not nailed down, benefits something else, and from the I don't spend money unless I have a reason to, uh, the only thing it buys me is a vote at the moment. Um, and I realize that the people are well-intentioned, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But from the immediate short-term perspective, that's all it buys me, and as a result of which, I'd be unlikely to spend that money. So I was curious how much the budget depended on people actually going to, through the membership right. process, et cetera, et cetera. First, I want to say you should not become a member. Uh, but, but no, because if that's the calculus you do, no, th th no then you've made the right choice, right. which is that, you know, if someone is sort of looking at this as a student or, or, or someone and says, you know, is, is it worth it to spend $100 a, a year for a vote, that's not a good deal. Um, if you're someone who's very interested in the future of the organization, then it's, it's a perfectly reasonable investment. Um, but that's really, you know, part of the reason for having it is, is so that it's not just whoever is, happens to go to a conference once in a couple of years and then decides that they feel like voting for something they know nothing about. It's something to help, help people sort of self-select. So whoever feels strongly about it, you know, whether they, they have the support to go to a conference or not can do it. Um, what we assumed were a relatively low number of attendees or pardon me, a relatively low number of members. Um, I think it maxes out at, at somewhere around 250 in 2012, um, and initially is, is somewhere around 100. So we're not talking that we need thousands of members. The initial numbers are very high, and this is part of the iterative process we did when we created the budget. I think the initial number was like 1,300 members, and we kicked that back, and, and they, you know, the membership group thought about it, and, and you know, by the end of the day, you know, we were talking sort of very low hundreds. Um, and I think that's... You know, in steady state in a couple of years, that's actually a pretty reasonable number to have. Um, when you look at the, the number of folks who come here, and if you look at the number of folks who are active in the government's process and the working groups, the steering committee, the, the communications committee, all the different groups, you're probably talking 40 or 50 people right there, almost all of whom would be willing to do this. Um, if you then look at people who've um, just gotten off those groups and are 
uh, being rehabilitated so that they can reenter society. You're talking probably another 20 people, especially the mailing list committee. Whew. Um, and then if you talk about people who sort of don't have time because of a job. Um, but I, I, the numbers are, are, I think, small and reasonable and, you know, not expecting that everyone who comes to a conference like this would want to do it. Exactly the opposite. Do we have the numbers here? Yeah. Um, I can certainly pull them up. Um, so, oh, okay. yes, in the slides that were a real eye test from Joe, um, at the end of the first year, so 2011, the assumption is only for 100 members. 2011, 155. 2012, 250, and 2013, 500. So it's very, very small in terms of budget contribution. Hey, everybody. Um, not to interject, and uh, I'm going to sit up here until everybody's done, but just so everybody knows, the social started 10 minutes ago. So if you have a comment, please come up. And uh, yeah. I know I'll sit here, and I bet the rest of these guys are dedicated enough to do yeah. so, but just want to let you know in case somebody was hoping to get free alcohol. Yeah. And, and in the budget, by the way, we only counted on 250 members in steady state. So very small. Mr. Yeah. Um, just an observation. Um, we did have a student serve on the program committee. So mm -hmm. um, there are certainly people who are likely to, in the student role, actually um, participate in both governance, voting, and so on. Thank you. Yeah. And, and that's something to think about when, when you guys are, some of folks here are throwing stones at membership. Um, you know, a lot of students can't afford what the rest of us might afford when we're working. So there is some sense in having a sharply discounted student membership. Um, you know, if you're, you're a Joe grad student, $100 is a lot, having been Joe grad student. You know, $20 might be a little more reasonable. So something to think about. Yeah, we cut you off, sorry. No, yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I don't actually really care if they can afford it or not. I wish to incentivize them to participate. Yeah. See, can we also get some B2B e-business synergies for that? Yeah. <laughs> He's going to punch me. Any other questions? Comments? Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, is there any yeah. more? <laughs> I don't know. No, that's it. All right. I, I, to, I had one question that wasn't budget related, it was bylaws related. Uh, the actual election for the bylaws, is this a good time to ask? Yes. Okay. Hi. Uh, Donnie Roisman here. Um, the the vote we're, that we have in front of us is adopting the bylaws in full. There's uh, I stumbled across one uh, error. And I was wondering how soon would we be looking at um, correcting them. Air, for example, in Section 9, when it talks about the committees, Section 9 lists four committees at the intro, but then actually details five committees uh, throughout the rest of Section 9. So how would we deal with something like that? Well, the, the, <laughs> there were a few choices. Uh, one thing is we'll need to take a look and decide what's controlling in there. Um, I suspect it would be the, uh, the enumerated list as opposed to the uh, introduction. But that's without looking at it. Um, we have two mechanisms to fix things if they're wrong. One of them is, as Steve pointed out, um, the board does have power to make emergency changes on a unanimous vote with varying limitations, like we can't vote to change the way we're elected or anything like that, um, <clears throat> or to give ourselves life memberships or anything like that. Um, so that's one alternative. The other alternative is to wait the year and put it through the normal amendment process. So it would depend on the uh, severity of the error and, and uh, how obvious the fix is and whether there's community support for it, I think. Thank you. Any other questions? Just one last note. Uh, when the charter came out in 2005, there were at least as many errors. And, and I say that as one of the people who wrote it. It was rife with mistakes. Um, and over the next 24 months, we fixed it. No matter how perfect people think it is, uh, there are a whole bunch of things that we will discover in any document like this that nine, six or nine months from now we'll hit ourselves in the head and go, wow, how, how stupid do we think we were? That's like the biggest mistake I've ever seen. Um, any mistakes you, you think you see now are easy to fix, but really there's going to be a big round of fixes in, in about six months just because there are emergent properties that we have no way of understanding. Any other questions or comments or Rotten Tomatoes or, or Louis? Louis Lee, Equinix. I'll be a member so you can count one for sure for for your budget. <laughs> <laughs> hey, okay.
All right. So those of you who stuck it out this long, thank you very much. Um, we'll en enjoy the rest of the conference, enjoy the social tonight, and, and uh, um, my advice is to vote yes on the uh, charter and wireless stuff. <laughs>